definite and renowned name in the pharmacy. Okay. Ji Hafsa, over okay, to you. Sir. Kindly introduce. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Good evening, Pakistan, and good morning, US. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us in this session. First of all, I would like to welcome our honorable guest, who is the legend of expertise in the field of pharmacy and is the author of world famous book of biopharmaceutics titled as Applied Biopharmaceutics and Pharmacokinetics. Thank you so much, sir, for your presence today. Then I would like to welcome convener of this session, Sir Malik Hassan Mahmood, who is head of pharmacology department, Government College University, Faisalabad, and co-convener of this session, Sir Liaqat Hussain from Government College University, Faisalabad, as well as the faculty members of Karachi University, Islamia University, Bahawalpur, Qaid Yazam Pharmacy College, Sahibal, Bahuddin Zikri University, and Lahore College of Pharmaceutical Sciences as well as the students of MPhil and Pharmacology Department. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us in this session. I have an announcement today. I want to clear that this event is free of any sort of sponsorship. We are not endorsing any paid promotions here. The thing is very simple. I humbly requested Sir Leon Chargel to address the students like me and enlighten us with a glimpse of his knowledge through the platform of Government College University, Faisalabad. And he is kind enough to accept this request and spare his time to make us feel honored today. Thank you so much, sir, once again. I will request Sir Malik Hassan Mahmood to formally welcome Sir Leon Charjal here. Thank you, sir. So Once sorry, again, thank sir, you very maybe. much, uh, Professor yes. Chargel. Welcome. Yeah. Yes, sir, please Hello, continue. Hello, Professor Chargel, can you hear me? I, I hear you fine, yes. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, and, and very nice to see you. Really honored to have you with us. So we don't only consider you uh, an excellent author. We, we consider you a big name in, in this field of pharmaceutical sciences, and we acknowledge your contribution. We, we, we always take a pride with your name when it always comes with, with, the, uh, with pharmacy institutes or the pharmacy education. So uh, I, I just warmly welcome you in our session, and I hope that uh, we, we, most of our senior and junior colleagues are with you. Uh, most of the students are with you. So we will request them. If they have any question in between the session, they'll just write those to us and we'll request you if we will, if the time will permit you, you and you will agree, then you will answer those as well. So thank you very much. So over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, sir Hassan, for welcoming Sir Leon Chargel. Uh, Applied Boy Book Pharmaceutics and Pharmacokinetics is the book that we Pakistani students are using as a reference book while consulting for the knowledge regarding our syllabus. And we are lucky enough that the author of this book, Sir Leon Charger, is here with us. I would request Sir Leon Charger to please hear your word of wisdom by first letting us know about the journey in this profession that you experience. Thank you so much, sir. Sir Leon Charger. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you for your kind words and kind invitation. It's really a pleasure to uh, meet everybody uh, virtually, uh, if I can't do it in person, but uh, it's very nice. Now, I was asked uh, to talk a little bit about how I got into biopharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics. Uh, and the one thing uh, that I have told many people is I never had biopharmaceutics or pharmacokinetics in my life. Uh, as a course or whatever, which surprises people. So what I thought I'd do is give a little background. Uh, and are you, can you put the little slides up or the PowerPoint that we have? And what I put on some PowerPoint is a little bit about my background, how I got to where I was, because I was told that that might be of interest. And then uh, a discussion on 
um, biopharmaceutics, pharmacokinetics, but, but from some different points of view since I've worked in industry and academics. So if we can put up that uh, PowerPoint, are you able to do that? Or transfer it to me? Okay. And do I have control or you have control of changing slides? This is all magic to me, you know, this marvelous technology. So if we can change it, I'll just say change the slide. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so presently, I, when I retired from industry, I formed my own company, which is called Applied Biopharmaceutics LLC. Uh, and I maintain a part-time appointment, both at Virginia Commonwealth University and University of Maryland. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, now, one of the things I got into pharmacy because of um, actually almost an accident. Uh, I started working and I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. That's where I grew up. And University of Maryland is in Baltimore and it's a state school. And at that time uh, I was able well, I'll start from the beginning. At age 14, I worked in a drugstore, uh, which is now called pharmacy. And at that point, I uh, needed to make extra money, so I continued working in a drugstore, and I became friends with a pharmacist at that time. And he said, why not University of Maryland Pharmacy? And I said, why? Because uh, I was interested in chemistry, not pharmacy. Uh, but he assured me that the bachelor's program in those days was very strong in chemistry. So I applied to the University of Maryland and I was accepted. Uh, and I received a BS in pharmacy. And as I mentioned, it was in those days, it was not a PharmD program. It was very uh, chemically oriented uh, and became a retail pharmacist. And you see on the bottom, I passed my examinations to practice pharmacy in Maryland, Massachusetts. And the District of Columbia is the area where Washington DC is. Uh, I was then able to get a fellowship to George Washington University Medical Center, which was with the National Institute of Health. So I worked with the uh, NIH and George Washington University and majored in pharmacology uh, with minors in phys physiology, biochemistry, and drug metabolism. Now, if you notice, there's nothing there about pharmacokinetics or biopharmaceutics at the time. Uh, so how did I get into this? We well, have to look at my first job. So we go to the next slide. Uh, a company, Sterling Winthrop Research Institute, which is now part of Sanofi, uh, upstate New York in Albany. It is now five degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which I don't know where that translates in Celsius, and they're getting 20 inches of snow today. <laughs> but in any case, I was there in Albany, New York uh, area, which is also Rensselaer, New York and got involved in drug metabolism, which was dealing with absorption distribution studies and um, metabolism, various studies of that sort in animals and in humans. Uh, I changed to teach in Boston at Northeastern University. And at that point in 1975, so this is before a lot of people's time, the pharmacy curriculum had started to insert uh, areas in biopharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics. It was just sort of its, in its infancy. And I was asked, since I had some background in the industry in drug metabolism, and I had a pharmacy degree, they assumed I knew everything about biopharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics, which I knew very little. Uh, and could you put a course together? And I said, okay, well, I'll give it a try. So I, I called around my colleagues at other colleges of pharmacy and I said, well, what are you doing for a course in biopharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics? And the answer I got was, I don't know, we have to teach this course because that's the new rules. So these are the rules that we're, we're supposed to put together a course. And I began to put together lectures in the area uh, and the students and I, I think I was uh, finishing up the lecture 15 minutes before I actually got in front of the students to teach and, and such. That's how much I was trying to 
put the courses together and, and put the students. And for the students, I, I put together a lot of um, sheets for them to learn on extra uh, practice problems, extra papers and things of this sort. The Dean of the university, Northeastern University said, you're giving out too many papers. Can you put it in a little booklet? So I said, okay, we'll put a little booklet. So I, I made up a booklet for students at Northeastern University. Now, Massachusetts College of Pharmacy is also in Boston and they like the booklet as well, but it was sort of practice problems. It was about how to do pharmacokinetics and some of the areas that I noticed that the students were having difficulty with uh, how to use uh, log tables. We didn't have this computers then, so we actually had log tables and e-tables to use, and things of this sort, sort of very basic kind of mathematics and kinetics approach. Uh, so this little booklet was sitting on my desk at Northeastern University and uh, a publisher, Appleton Century Crofts came in to sell me a book and noticed my little booklet and said, have you ever thought of making this into a real book? And I said, no. I said, why don't you give it a try? So by 1980, I now published the first applied biopharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics. And the reason where there's another fellow in there, a good colleague of mine, Andrew Yu. Now, Dr. Yu is from uh, China originally, who emigrated to the United States. He finished his PhD at the University of Connecticut uh, with um, computers and pharmacokinetics and uh, pharmaceutics. And he wanted to learn more English, and I wanted to learn more math. So uh, Dr. Andrew Yu and myself, we, we put this together. I had him check the math, and I wrote most of the book, and he checked that the accuracy of the equations and such. And that's really how the applied biopharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics started. And since then, uh, it has expanded. Um, and my jobs started changing. I went from Northeastern to Mass College of Pharmacy, then to um, a generic company called Chelsea Labs and Farm, Forest Labs, Pharmacokinetics, and you see the whole list. My last full-time job, it looks like I can't keep the job if you look at all these things, uh, was at Sandoz. And at Sandoz, I was vice president of biopharmaceutics and headed up all the clinical studies for generic drug development. So we go to the next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, now one of the things I was asked is uh, how do you become a success? Now I'm not sure how one defines a success, but I think the idea of having a career and being active in your profession is very important. And it's nice, it's very nice that I'm invited to uh, give a talk with you in Pakistan, uh, even virtually. And it's been very nice that I've been able to travel and, and attend workshops and such. And in, in order to uh, do this, <clears throat> it's important that as a career, get involved, and get involved in, and do professional activities as well as pro bono activities. And some of the things I got involved with uh, I was on the Institutional Review Board for National Institute of Drug Abuse. Uh, Massachusetts had a state formulary commission that dealt with generic drugs. Uh, there was other things as you see going down. Uh, some of the things of interest was getting involved with FDA Pharmaceutical Sciences Committee. Uh, and I'll speak on that. Getting involved in, I don't have it on the list, but I is the United States Pharmacopeia, which I was on, and I see I'm missing that on the list, and a number of other things. So getting involved with your professional activities, get, getting in really is important. It, it makes you more knowledgeable as a person and, and really helps uh, networking and such. So we go to the next slide, please. Well, I think 
urge and that happen that go along. But in the meantime, it's important to stay active. Can we move forward or can I take control of the slides? Can we go to the next slide? Okay, um, we're all there then. So things, no, go to back, back one, please. Okay. So one of the things to be su successful, however you define successful, is to network and, and be involved and, and participate in organizations. The other is giving presentations, similar to I'm giving one here, uh, publishing, and I'm a big believer of charity, you know, getting involved in your community and in Latin it's pro bono for uh, free, you're giving up your time. It makes, I think, a better person and more creative and learning about uh, the people that you're, you're dealing with from day to day. So that's important. Now we can go to the next slide. All right, so the book on the left was the very first book that came out, Applied Biopharmaceutics. I wrote about 90% of it. Andrew, you checked all my math to make sure it was right. And for whatever reason, <clears throat> it became very popular. Uh, coming out this month is a, an eighth edition, which is big and thick, and it has grown uh, into such a field that one is ne neither Dr. Yu or myself can keep up with everything in the field. And I am very happy that we were able to have uh, one, uh, Dr. Murray Ducharme, who is from in Canada, uh, in pharmacokinetics, younger guy, a lot of energy, and many authors uh, who are willing to give their time and energy to contribute to the textbook. So I am thankful to do that. And that, that's one of the things about networking and being involved. You're able to meet some very nice people, some uh, uh, people very knowledgeable, and many of them were able to give their time uh, to write a chapter. Now, one question before we had started, we talked about it casually, is that the book doesn't cover everything for everybody. This is always an issue, uh, ever since from the very first issue, is that we covered basically uh, the original objectives were for teaching pharmacy students, pharmacokinetics and biopharmaceutics. Uh, we've had requests about clinical pharmacy. We have had requests about um, basic biopharmaceutics, more on bioequivalents, more on computers, more on protein binding, more on biosimilars, more on complex drugs. Uh, the question here is how much can you put in a textbook? And if you're really aiming for students, you have a finite time in terms of how much knowledge you're trying to put into your year's course. So that is why there's always a deficiency by some people and a criticism, well, how come you didn't put something in there? Or could you have put something else? Or the other criticism is, we don't really teach clinical pharmacokinetics and you have a lot of clinical pharmacokinetics in it. So uh, once you write something, there's always some criticism, good or bad, <clears throat> Uh, as it follows, but I, I'm very pleased that the reception has been very good and I thank everybody who are using it and feeling it's useful. Now we can go to the next slide. I know you're anxious to go to that. So let's go to the next slide. So one of the things I have been doing is keeping active in writing. I, I no longer do basic research, which I enjoy. And there are books on generic drugs and my latest writing is on the bottom. I actually have five of them now are, are children's stories. Now, from my students, I think they prefer the rainbow tree and the children's stories to learning how to do pharmacokinetics, but I'll, I'll let you have that as uh, your own idea. Okay, next slide. 
we can move on. Thank you. So one of the skills that is important for students and even adults, and I do some teaching on the side of English as a second language uh, as a free, it is learning to uh, have good oral communication, to be able to commute. As a pharmacist uh, dispensing drugs, you're, it's important to be able to commute, uh, communicate with patients to make them understand uh, the drugs, how they're used, how they're properly do, if there's going to be side effects and anything of that sort. And communication with physicians or other technical people, that's also very important. So communication is really important. Uh, writing is important to be able to do that. Now, in writing the textbook or writing a paper, since we have some international people uh, reading the book, uh, for those who know that trying to learn a language, slang is very difficult to uh, understand. So trying to keep your writing clear and concise is, is sometimes difficult and important. And I have been accused at times that, well, it wasn't quite clear enough and uh, that it is, is, is an issue in, in writing, making sure that when you're writing these ideas and some of the ideas, particularly in pharmacokinetics, can be uh, more difficult to understand until you sort of play with the numbers and the equations and then it, it comes easier. Now, if you're working in industry or elsewhere, it's important to be able to work as a team. Most of the companies have teamwork approach to things. Uh, working independently, management skills, and being able to create something new. Uh, so th these are some of the skills for success. Uh, next slide. And one of the things, as I mentioned in uh, that computers, you know, I've been trying to learn computers for the last 50 years. Uh, things are changing very quickly. Um, I didn't know about pharmacokinetics until sometime after graduate school. Uh, in, in real life. So you need to keep your skills up, being willing to change. The, the world is changing quickly. Uh, it's also sort of fun to learn new, school, new skills. And one of the problems we had uh, with some people is, well, they, they were intelligent, but didn't want to use their time or money or whatever to go to um, try to take a course or to learn something or go to a professional organization uh, meeting because it took a little bit of time and energy to do that. Uh, uh, it's useful to do that. And in the long run, it, it's very good. Now the next uh, slide. Next slide. Okay. And the other thing about I found out through the years that I've been here is taking risks you know, the idea of trying something new, taking a chance. Uh, you may write something, uh, you may do something, and it doesn't work out. Now, there, Peter Drucker, whose name is on the bottom here, uh, was a fellow who uh, advised the Fortune 500 companies, uh, like General Electric, General Motors, and others. And he basically said the following, people who don't take risks generally make about two mistakes a year. People who do take risks generally make about two mistakes a year. So any of us who say we've never made a mistake has a very short memory. I, it would be my, my feeling. Okay, now we'll go to the next slide. All right, so now we're so much about careers and, and the background. What I wanna go on now is, it, is three areas to cover in, in the time that we have left. Um, and, one is, is issues in the development of new drugs. And then I want to go to drug product performance in vitro, which will deal with biopharmaceutics aspects, uh, the solution in, in vitro and vivo. And lastly, come into the human studies in vivo and bioequivalence. And if we have time, a touch on complex drug products and a touch on biologics. So if we go to the next slide, okay. Uh, this is an area that is not in the textbook. Uh, there are a lot of areas in the textbook. And in the National Institutes of Health, I, I was a young uh, graduate student 
and I thought science was wonderful and I still do. I, I hope never to change that. And that everything should be driven by science. In reality, doing science. And it's, it's deal, dealt with economics uh, in terms of drug development. And if we think about it, the major drug companies uh, around the world, they, they're looking uh, at drugs uh, as being a profitable commodity. Now, that doesn't mean that they're doing something wrong. It's good to have new drugs. But what happens is when we're looking at new drugs, they're going to target major diseases and the size of the market. A lot of people have high blood pressure. A lot of people have cancer. A lot of people have diabetes, asthma, and other things. So there's a tendency to do research at these areas where there's a lot of people. And, and it's certainly helpful to have a drug that help most people most of the time. Now, the people who do generic drugs who want to jump in, if the market is big, and I'll use an example of Lipitor, uh, which lowers cholesterol, at one time, the market for Lipitor, it was one of the best sellers, was about $10 billion a year, which is a big number to me, I mean, $10 billion. So generic companies, including Sandoz, and I was involved in doing a generic drug, uh, are going to look to see, can we get part of that $10 billion a year? Can we get a market share in the size of the market? So those drugs that have large uh, volume, uh, the generic companies are going to look at it. Those drugs that have smaller volumes, it may be pricely, generic drug manufacturers may not get in there because they feel that it's not going to be profitable enough to do that. Now, along with the economics becomes the legislator. Each country has its own laws. And sometimes we give tax breaks for um, companies that do research and development, at least in the United States, to encourage developing of drugs. Uh, the term orphan drugs are drugs to treat rare diseases. Now, the It doesn't appear profitable for major companies to look for cures for a very rare diseases. So we often have the legislature to build back. Uh, during the Second World War, the United States started developing penicillin and tetracycline. Uh, they put a lot of effort to Pfizer and, and other companies to do that. So there are times where companies uh, will be subsidized or the legislation will subsidize them. But then you get the other thing is that because of competition and of the mergers, that laws will begin to change whether generic drugs or branded drugs, uh, they compete on the marketplace and various laws about how they should be made and all become developed. Now we go to the next slide, if we can. Now, what happens in a law is that politically or better we'll say, okay, we should have new and safe drugs. Well, that sounds good. Uh, the question is, what do we mean by safe drugs? The water we drink should be safe or the air we breathe should be safe. So that's what the legislation is, is that we should have safe drugs. <clears throat> Regulatory is uh, the area where the actual work in government begins is we have people who put regulations in. So the water we drink should not have arsenic or any other bad stuff in it. So how much arsenic would be allowable? Zero or uh, 10 parts per million or something. Somewhere along the line, there's a regulation that will tell you what can be in or what can be out. Uh, or how safe should a drug be? Uh, cancer chemotherapy uh, drugs, really not that safe, but when you consider the problem of, of having cancer and dying, I think you take the drug if you know that it'll help. So regulatory uh, 
regulations are important and they sort of set the tone and they sometimes change. There are, should be collaboration with science. And I've been fortunate to be on a number of regulatory science uh, committees uh, in which you're trying to bring in, well, the science, how bad uh, or how safe can we adjust on this? There is, a, again, I speak to the United States about COVID, people are worried about whether the vaccine is safe or not safe. And yet we can look at many of our drugs like opiates and say, how safe is Oxycontin uh, if, if we take it? We know there's a lot of more overdoses in opiates than there are deaths in vaccines. In fact, there's negligible deaths in vaccines in the United States. So again, uh, these are issues. We have uh, the United States Pharmacopeia, which are involved in putting uh, monographs out that deal with regulatory, and they have the FDA and internationally ICH. So then we come to the science. And I always felt that science should be the driving force, but as you see, I, I put it on the bottom of this list. Um, and, and the question really is, how do you demonstrate safety and efficacy? If you're doing a new drug and, and you really hope that the drug is going to be work in, in the way it is, um, we have a series of steps where we have uh, animal studies, toxicity studies, and we put it into humans uh, as an experimental drug. I, then we look at some of the pharmacokinetics and we look at the uh, efficacy and such. But somewhere along the line, we have to make a decision. Is the drug safe enough to now market? And that's the question. There are generally adverse effects and other effects on the drug. And when we come to the generic drugs, we want to be sure that if we take a generic drug, we're going to get the same safety efficacy as a brand drug. And again, we get the issue of what kind of science do we need to demonstrate that the drug is therapeutic equivalent and can be substituted for the generic drug. And later in this discussion, I'll talk about some of the science behind this. But th these are some of the issues. And uh, I point to everybody who is in the pharmaceutic or professional to get involved because this discussion is always an ongoing and, and it doesn't really end because we had new knowledge about new drugs and new approaches. So we go to the next slide, please. Okay, so in, in our country, and I was asked in a number of countries, use the Food and Drug Administration uh, as sort of a guide on development of drugs and how we, we do our safety guidelines and all that. Interesting enough, the FDA was developed or, or started in 1906. And it was started because there was big controversy out of the, some of the food industry and some other industry that would show that they had that there was some contamination and some other things, and some people had died. So usually it takes something like that. Uh, and in 1906, a law was passed called the Federal Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, uh, which provided that uh, we would have somewhat uh, safe food and, and drugs. And what they mostly meant was that the drug should have what is said in there. If the drug contained strychnine, that was okay because they didn't look at whether it killed anybody, but it should have be pure and have certain basic quality. Uh, and indeed in 1906, there was a product called iron quinine and strychnine elixir uh, used as a stimulant. Uh, because of the USP and, and a national formulary was around, in this law in 1906, it recognized the United States Pharmacopeia and the national formulary as an important book to establish quality standards, which we'll talk about as well. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so the Food and Drug Now mission, and you can go to FDA.gov, their mission now is responsible for protecting the public health by ensuring the safety, efficacy, and security of human and veterinary drugs, biological products, medical devices, and ensuring the safety of nation's food supply, cosmetics, and products that emit radiation. Now, this took a long time. From 1906, various things happened, actually. They found that although they were labeled, um, 
It took till 1970s to say that the drugs had to be effective. It was interesting, 70 years before the laws came to say, okay, you have the drug inside, but it was never really stated it had to be effective. And over the years, uh, um, we've gotten a little bit better at looking at our drugs. And the FDA also looks at veterinary drugs, food, cosmetics as well. Next slide, please. All right, the United States Pharmacopeia uh, was established in 1820, that's the USP, by a group of physicians. And interesting, in 1820, uh, the physicians felt that pharmacists were not consistent in making products. A lot of the products were compounded. Uh, there were elixirs, there were tinctures, there were extracts, fluid extracts, and things of that sort. Uh, and they're very inconsistent. So the United States Pharmacopeia uh, was established to put standards together. <clears throat> and the national formulary, which came out in 1988, was really by a group of pharmacists who also thought we should have something about the excipients that we use. So if we use honey in our product, if we use lactose in our product, if we use something else in our product, that should also have standards of quality. They eventually combined to be the USP and NF. Now, it's a little different in this country is that the USP is an independent uh, organization, but it does work with FDA. And it is put together by groups of expert committees. And I spent 10 years on the uh, biopharmaceutics expert committee, <coughs> excuse me, in which we looked at drug product performance, dissolution, and some other aspects. So there are committees that look at um, excipients, there are committees that look at food, there are committees that look at other things. So USP functions by groups of experts. They're not paid and uh, we do it uh, because we're interested in promoting standards and uh, it's become very um, important that they're established well. Next slide. Okay, so let's now talk about the science. That's the background and go forward into biopharmaceutics uh, and drug product performance and, and how we put all this together. Next slide, please. Okay, biopharmaceutics, uh, most of you probably are aware, is the relationship of the physical chemical properties of the drug, the dosage form in which the drug is given, the rate of administration or bioavailability of drug. That's a mouthful. Basically, if you think about it, you don't give a pure drug. Even in the so-called old days in the 1820s when the USP was made, put together, it was realized that you take a drug and you put it with something. Okay, so that is the excipients. You make a pill, you make a tablet, you make a, a solution. That however you make it, that's going to affect how that drug is going to come out of the tablet or the capsule and into the body. So we have a measurement bioavailability, which is used a lot. And what we're using that term is looking at the rate and extent in which the active ingredient uh, is absorbed from the drug body to the site of action. And sometimes that's not always very clear. We know that the drug has to come out of the product, the tablet, uh, at some rate and some amount. So if you have 100 milligrams of drug, uh, how fast does that come out? And does all 100 milligrams come into the body? And we'll discuss that as well, as we know in general that maybe 100 milligrams won't get absorbed into the body. Some of the components of biopharmaceutics is the drug substance, the drug product, uh, manufacturing method, and root administration, which I'll have more to say. Ne next slide. Okay, so this one you've probably seen or used in your classroom. Uh, it's really an old sign, but, it, but it's, it's still valid. The, the point I want to push here is that the drug is given in some sort of matrix, some sort of product, as I said, in a tablet. And eventually the drug comes out of the body, uh, out of the tablet, and into the systemic circulation, which we call absorption. Once the drug is absorbed, it goes wherever it's going to go. And as a uh, pharmaceutics person or biopharmaceutics, uh, manufacturer of drug products, we don't have much control once the drug gets in the body. 
So the drug gets in the body, it gets metabolized, it gets excreted, it goes to uh, the cells, it does a pharmacologic effect or it does an adverse effect, uh, whatever. So what do we work with? We're working with this first arrow. We're having a product and somehow we want to figure out a method in which the drug gets out of the product and into the, in this case, systemic circulation, or if it were topical, you put it on the skin, that it gets through the skin and to wherever it's supposed to go. So next slide. Okay, so we look at it in both things. We look at the drug substance, the active ingredient, uh, and the physical chemical properties. We know that uh, the solubility is important uh, in terms of the drug being water soluble or not water soluble. And by chemical properties, we can make different salts of the product. We can make a potassium salt, which may be more water soluble than a calcium salt, or we can do other kinds of things with the chemistry. The physical part would be, say, particle size. Uh, larger particles dissolve more slowly than smaller particles. Or we can also think in terms of polymorph, a, a crystalline substance is much more stable uh, than an amorphous or non-crystalline sub substance. So just the characteristics of the drug substance. Now, when you synthesize a drug substance, depending upon the route of uh, synthesis, there are gonna be a certain amount of impurities. And it's important that we remove usually as much impurity as possible. And this is where, again, the science and the regulation is how pure is the drug substance supposed to be? Does it have zero impurities? Well, that may be not as true in, with some types of products, uh, particularly in the biologicals, where it is much and any stability of, of the drug substance uh, is also important. Now, once you got the drug substance, you have to put it in some sort of drug product or a finished dosage form. So how you do that in terms of manufacturing method uh, is important. Uh, the root administration will determine what type of drug product. Are you going to do it for oral? You're going to do it for uh, intravenous? Are you going to do it for inhalation? Whatever else. And again, stability is also important, but stability can also be affected by excipients. What else you have there can interact with the uh, drug substance. And then you have, as I mentioned, that idea of drug release. Uh, and that is, is important to understand. Do we design a drug product to release the drug slowly or do we design the drug product to have a very quick release and such? Next slide. So some of the considerations if you're making a drug product is what, what kind of product do you really want to treat what kind of disease? All right, do, do you want it to be very rapidly absorbed? Uh, do you want it to come in slowly? Do you, is this for chronic use? Is this gonna to be topical? Is it gonna be a cream or ointment? Is it gonna be an inhalation product or such? So you have to have some sort of therapeutic objective. You have to have an idea of what the disease that's treatment and, and such. The active pharmaceutical ingredient, as I mentioned, it's important. Uh, part of the therapeutic objective would be the route of administration. Uh, it's easier to take oral drugs than to give them by uh, injection. So if you can do it by orally, that's usually preferable. Uh, the dosage regimen has to be determined. Are you going to have a large or small dose? Uh, in general, most people can't swallow a tablet larger than a thousand milligram. So if you're going to use a large dose, um, you have to figure out whether you're going to break it up into smaller tablets and give three tablets instead of one tablet or something of that sort. And we also should think about the patient, whether the patient really is gonna be able to swallow that drink or swallow the tablet or whatever. And there are different types and excipients and method of manufacturing. So next slide. I'm gonna go through some of these quickly because I think if this, this is rewarded, we can always look back and see all the detail. So some of the physical chemical properties that I mentioned that are important when we consider that is the uh, Yeah, 
understanding a little echo chamber here, particle size polymorphic. So th these are things that we look for when we start putting together a drug product. And they're part of the whole biopharmaceutics picture, anything that affects the drug product. Next slide. Okay, so we had the idea that we have to put excipients and things and manufacture a drug product. But one of the things, and, and going back to the United States, was recognize the fact that there must be a quality products. A drug product quality is important. And if it's not uh, quality, I hope you're great for hearing me, um, it is that we're really related to biopharmaceuticals. The, the uh, drug product quality by pharmaceuticals and physical chemical properties to the drug product in vitro and in vivo. Now, one important term that we're coming to is drug product performance in vivo, in vitro. But uh, what I have here is the idea that if we got two tablets, or let's say you get a prescription for one, product, uh, uh, Lipitor, whatever you want to have, or ibuprofen. The next time you get a tablet, don't know. I want to stay on this slide. Please go back. Thank you. Uh, there seems to be a lot of noise coming through here for some reason. All right, so the drug product performance, we're using this term more often is we're defining as the release of the drug substance from the drug product leading to bioavailability of the drug. And one of the main things that we're interested in is that whenever we take a different batch of drugs and we take a, or renew a prescription, that it's gonna perform the same way as the first batch. They all perform the same way. Uh, lately, the United States Pharmacopeia is getting into performance tests to relate the quality of the drug and the clinical product safety. So this is important. We have performance tests in vitro and in vivo. Now let's go to the next slide now. One, one of the things that FDA has been looking at, and this is an older picture, but they've used the same one, is they're looking at risks from medicines. Now, if you think about a, a product or any product, there's always some sort of risk you know, that, that there's going to be a side effect um, that you know about. Some can be avoided, some not. Uh, for example, uh, the drug uh, is an antihistamine and you feel very sleepy taking uh, the antihistamine. Well, that, that you know, it's a side effect that's unavoidable, but you don't worry about it too. And some of the other ones may be uh, avoidable would be some drug interaction that you shouldn't take this drug with something else. One issue that is happening in our pharmaceutical industry and then physicians is making errors, medication errors. Another one is product quality defects. Now this is the one that we address more in the pharmaceutical industry. And, and that is a very important. So we go to the next slide. So there's a certain uncertainty and risk whenever we take a drug, but there should be no risk that in the quality of the medication that's manufactured. And that's why I put it there. This is the one that we really want to be sure that we're doing. The other ones, we would love never to have a medication there, and we would like not to have uh, side effects. One that is a very difficult one, and when I worked in the branded side of the industry, we discussed this more than once, is these rare events that occur. Now, if you think about in the development of a new drug, the drug is developed, it goes through a series of tests and clinical trials, and it may be only 3,000 or 4,000 people get the drug in the clinical trials, and it looks very good, and there are no major problems. Once that drug is on the market, you don't know how people are going to take the drug. Millions of doses are out there, and something can happen, and, and sometimes it does. There are questions whether is it related to the drug that you took, did the person take a drug plus something else? Uh, what was the reason behind, say, an adverse event that was unexpected and not studied? So th these are sometimes very difficult. 
to uh, a certain before the drug is approved. So that's why every now and then when we start seeing adverse events occurring once a drug is marketed uh, and the FDA now requires post-marketing surveillance. They wanna follow the drug for the lifetime that it's on the market. So we know about any adverse problems and the drug might be with, withdrawn if this occurs. The next slide, please. Okay, so recalls are more general because of manufacturing problems and things, uh, these I took off of some of the recall lists and you see particulate matter and sterile solution, lack of sterility, uh, incorrect tablet. And most of all of this is human error, which is a problem. I don't know whether we go to more robotics will decrease that, but in any case, there seems to be human re problems that are doing this. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so gather that drug product quality is important. And I'm gonna look at the bottom of this slide. It says quality is maintained by implementing systems and procedures that are followed during the development of manufacturing the product. The, the point here is you can have, and I used to use the automobile as an example, the, you buy brakes that are really top quality, but you put them on wrong on the car. So even though you had top quality uh, brakes, the manufacturing process of putting the brakes on the car was a problem. The car crashes because it can't stop. Well, you can have quality excipients, all the excipients you put in, the lactose, the magnesium stearate, the active ingredient, all the things should be high quality. But also during the development, and you have to build in quality during the manufacture. And there are certain steps in the manufacturing that we consider critical steps. An example would be weighing of the active ingredient. And Years ago, we used to say you needed two people to weigh a substance. Why do you need two people? Well, the reason was you wanted to be sure that the weighing was checked by a second person. Now more of it is doing by computer checks and such, but still that is an area that you know is a critical area, making sure you have the proper amount of drug in the tablet at every time. So we can think of several other areas that might be critical sterility of an injection, very important. So next slide. So we, we look at performance as keeping the drug product consistent for safety and efficacy. So when we consider what, what are some tests for performance in vivo, uh, bioavailability by equivalence, that every time you do the bioavailability or by equivalent study, you get similar blood level time curve. And that's expensive to do. So in vitro, you might do dissolution. And we do that, and we'll talk about that. So those are two measures uh, of drug product performance. And we're looking at that in a sense that when we deal with making and manufacturing a drug product, uh, drug products are done in batches. And even for the brand, there are some small batch-to-batch -batch differences. And these are have to be checked. And that's the end product testing. You need to check the drug pro, um, quality of the drug product as you manufacture it. And at the end, you want to look at uh, the dissolution and such. Uh, same with the ge generic drug product substitution. We want to be sure they're bioequivalent and behave properly. Next slide. Now, the issue then, which happens in many countries, uh, that I've been to is that you have the brand product and you have other products that claim to have the same active ingredient. In fact, some will say, well, we conform to the USP and NF. So I've been in uh, South America where they have the brand and uh, I'm thinking Brazil was a workshop and we had a big discussion about brand and, and Brazil was trying to increase and improve its generic drug industry. This is a few years ago. And they had local drugs that they called similarities. These were companies, um, usually local in action that made the product, but they didn't bother doing in vivo uh, performance studies. 
So the question is, well, we contain ibuprofen that meets USP. It should be equivalent to uh, Motrin brand ibuprofen. Well, the, the thing that we realize is that even though they say they're pharmaceutic equivalent, unless you do the product performance studies, it doesn't mean that they're going to be equivalent in terms of drug product performance, because the way you manufacture it, the way you put these things together can affect how the drug is released in vivo. Next, next slide. Next slide. Okay, so we had the issue, what is a pharmaceutical equivalent? And our brain would say, gee, they're equal. The uh, Food and Drug Administration says drug products uh, in identical dosage forms, root of administration that contain identical amount of the identical active ingredient, the same salt and the same therapeutic moiety. I, I put in the italics. And drug products must meet the identical compendia, by that they mean USP, or other applicable standards of identity, strength, quality, purity, and potency. Well, okay, so we got the words identical and we got the words same uh, there. So we have the next slide. The problem when we're dealing with the word identical, even though it's in the regulations, is what is meant by identical. So you, you make a drug product that has a certain particle size, say 100 microns in diameter. I make another product and it only has 80 micron particle size. Are they identical? Uh, they're probably the same drug, the same thing, and probably not much different, but how do we deal with that, that term identical? And the FDA also uses the word same, and does same mean identical? Well. That's this issue too. Now, it has actually gone to uh, courts and when the generics are coming out, uh, one would make a polymorph of one type of active ingredient and the other company made a polymorph of a different type. And the claim was that the generic polymorph wasn't the same as the brand polymorph, which it wasn't. But the generic says, well, it's the same when you put it in solution who cares about the polymorph? They're both in solution. They both get absorbed the same way, um, but they're not identical in that same. So with infinite wisdom, as you know, all governments have infinite wisdom and they established the term equivalent. So equivalent means what? Uh, means whatever you want it to mean almost. So you put some sort of specifications or statistics and you say if it's Ah, I lost the slide. Okay, so we go to the next slide. Okay. And the next slide says, all right, we understand that we have equivalents. And when we talk about equivalents, we're talking about both the drug product and the active ingredient. And even though we can't say they're identical, we have some sort of equivalent way uh, of measuring that, this, that they are the same. And we'll use the word same even though it doesn't. So uh, there's another term, pharmaceutical alternatives. This brings a lot of confusion to people. And, and it's drug products that contain... Drug, there's a question. Drug products that contain the identical therapeutic quality uh, or precursor and not necessarily the same amount of dosage form or the same salt or ester. Okay, let's look at this a little more clearly. So an example is tetracycline hydrochloride and tetracycline phosphate complex. Now, if you're treating a particular uh, infection that you know tetracycline will work, uh, probably makes no difference therapeutically whether you give the tetracycline hydrochloride or the tetracycline phosphate complex. But the FDA and others feel that these are not equivalent uh, active ingredients because different salts have different solubilities. And uh, we said equivalent, it really means more the same. And the hydrochloride could be argued as not the same as a phosphate. But we know that tetracycline is tetracycline and it would really pretty much have the same therapeutic effect. Now, the other is, issue is an ester because esters uh, are also changing solubility and uh, has to be usually hydrolyzed for the active drug. So those are considered pharmaceutical alternatives. 
Now, one area that is an alternative in this country, but not an alternative in other countries, is a capsule formulation and a tablet formulation. And I have an example here, of quinidine sulfate. If you have quinidine sulfate in a tablet and quinidine sulfate in a capsule, you can be bioequivalent to it, but from the point of view of our FDA, they're not equivalent uh, because they feel that they're different dosage forms. But in some countries, in Europe and South Africa, I do not know about Pakistan, the tablets and the, uh, uh, and the capsule are interchangeable. Uh, so that is the way it works, at least in the United States. Next slide. So we had the idea that multi-source products are contain the same active ingredient, same dosage given by the same root administration. Next slide. Now, generic products I use as a subset because generic products, particularly in the United States and now Europeans, Canada, uh, and I'm ignorant on Pakistani laws, but generic products. Generic drug products have to meet certain performance standards and have the same drug product performance. This is very important. So in the US, you can trust generic drug, drug products and you can trust the brand products because they're approved by the same FDA and they have to go. You can, all right, go to the next slide. You can go. Next slide. So in generic drugs, you have to have drug product quality that's identified by what we call chemistry manufacturing controls, microbiology, strength, all, all these FDA will look at uh, and they conform and we do drug product performance tests by availability, by equivalence and drug release tests. Next slide. Next slide. All right, so let's see how this works in manufacturing. And, and it's actually, I thought interesting as I sort of developed this scheme some time ago, a new drug manufacturer makes an active pharmaceutical ingredient that it looks in preclinical, looks like it works, uh, it doesn't kill rats or anything, uh, and then puts it in humans and eventually they do a clinical trial. And they use usually a simple formula, maybe just a capsule and uh, a formulation with lactose and the active ingredient sheet. Can we go back? So we have uh, clinical efficacy studies and we'll do pharmacokinetic and bioavailability studies. Assuming all that goes well, the FDA will approve the drug. Uh, we'll, we'll think about going for drug approval. But before they go to actual drug approval, the drug company may want to make a formulation that it's easy to manufacture, be acceptable, and that's what I'm calling the marketed drug product. So this could be a fancy tablet that's coated uh, that has the insignia and the color and everything else. It's a finished dosage form. Uh, but it wasn't the dosage form as the capsule that was used in the clinical study. So what the uh, manufacturer, the brand does, does a bridging study or studies that are dissolution or bioequivalent studies. These are performance studies to show that it does the same as the original capsules done in the clinical study. Now, let's say the drug is approved, it, it does quite well, and now uh, the company wants to move a manufacturing site or use different approach to manufacturing is called post-approval changes. The drug has been approved, but we're going to do some changes. We're going to, instead of making 2 million tablets, we're going to make 10 million tablets. So we need bigger capacity, bigger machines or whatever else. So there's a need to compare the drug that you make after you enlarge the recipe and you make it larger. Uh, number of tablets that you're doing now, 10 million tablets instead of 2 million tablets, uh, does that compare to the previous product? In the meantime, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, we need more of it, or there's a, another way of making it less expensively. So there may be a change in the active pharmaceutical ingredient. All this changes have to be checked out by drug performance studies. So the next slide becomes the generic side of the industry. Next slide. So on the generic side of the industry, they're trying to make a drug product that's gonna have the same uh, performance as the brand. 
so you can interchange it safely. So the problem sometimes generic company has is that there is a patent on the active pharmaceutical ingredient on how it's made. The patent usually runs out on the ingredient itself. So the uh, brand manufacturer makes the uh, active ingredient, say A plus B goes to active ingredient, and there's a patent on it. So generic manufacturer says, no, we can't do that because we're going to get sued. So we'll have to go X plus Y and make the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So the moment you do that, by using a different synthetic pathway, you may come out with a different set of impurities. You may get a different particle size. You may get a different polymorph or something else. So again, you have to show, uh, in terms of that term I use, pharmaceutical equivalents, that the generic active ingredient is a pharmaceutical equivalent to the brand active ingredient. And as an aside, if we get to the biologicals, sometimes the structure of biological are much more difficult than a simple molecule such as ibuprofen. It would be easier to show uh, that it's the same. Okay, so the generic drug manufacturer now puts the active ingredient, which he assures is an equivalent to the brand, uh, into a drug product. We've got another problem. The generic drug product cannot use the same delivery system as the brand because the brand patented the product. It's using um, an osmotic approach to releasing the drug out of this little laser drilled hole, uh, often called an Oris product or something of that sort. So the generic drug product has to use a different method of uh, in release of the drug. They're making an extended release product. The drug has to leach out uh, some way, some sort of matrix, and the generic has to figure out a method that doesn't infringe on the patent of the brand. However, the end result should be that the performance of the product in doing a bioequivalent study and dissolution study is the same as that of the brand. And again, if the generic product is approved and, and uh, there are changes occur, it again has to use the drug product performance uh, of the previous. So the interesting point here, uh, and we can go to the next slide, is, is that we see changes in formulation over time. And each step of the way, we need to be sure that the new formulation or the modified formulation it is the same uh, performance as the original formulations and the original that was used in clinical trials. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, would you like to take a break of 10 minutes? Because you were talking continuously. You, you may be tired. Uh, let's go to the end of this and then we'll do that if that's okay. I'll make my final point to you until we get to the next section. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So I just want to finish out on this and we'll get to another section. So we have the idea that one is formulations do change and that we use drug product performance studies to try to make sure that all the formulations may be changing at times. And, and by change, it's usually not a drastic change, but we want to be sure that that quality of the product, the way it's manufactured and all, and we do the performance studies. Next, next slide. Next slide. Now, the interesting thing is because there are different regulatory uh, groups in each country, we also find that in different brand, the brand name company uh, manufactures maybe slightly different product depending upon where, where it is. Uh, for example, Pfizer is a very large company, but it has manufacturing, I think, in India, as well as the US, as well as maybe uh, Europe. So there may be slight differences in the manufacturing. And in general, we know that they're not always bioequivalent to each other. Uh, and usually, this is not a clinical issue. OK, next slide, please. All right, so this may be a place we're going to talk about how to do drug product performance in vitro, say about five minutes or so, where we can continue if everybody's okay. Let's continue for a little bit. I'll, I'll stay to break, place for a break, if that's okay with you.
All right, let's go to the next slide. We'll talk about drug product performance and probably after we get through this section, we'll take a quick break. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, when we're talking about in vitro studies, I mean, we've all heard about dissolution and things of this sort. Uh, the, the question is how useful is it and what does it tell you? It is useful, but it doesn't always tell you what you want. We, we consider a rate limiting step uh, and when we series of kinetic process and that's the slowest step in there. Now, the last step in this picture is the absorption step. And I said before that was where we're really aiming. We want somehow or other to eventually get the drug in the body into the site of action. But before that, the drug is given in some matrix. And, and for this is represented of an oral, say, uh, tablet here. So the tablet has to break apart once you swallow the tablet and disintegrates into small particles. The particles then they go into solution in the gastrointestinal tract. And as the solution is in the gastrointestinal tract, usually the duodenal area, it gets absorbed into the body. So whatever the slowest step is going to be the rate limiting step. So next, next slide. So when we're dealing with immediate release, usually they disintegrate quickly and dissolution is not much of a problem. Uh, a dis disintegration test, when we look at it, is a measurement of the formation of fragments, granules, or aggregates from the solid dosage form. USP uh, defines disintegration as that state in which any residue of the tablet, except for fragments of insoluble coating remaining in the screen of the test apparatus in the soft mass, have no palpably firm core. <clears throat> you notice that wording by USP often is very uh, oh, involved. It almost sounds like a lawyer in, in this. And this is what I was saying about having concise statements. But if we go to the next slide. Next slide. Okay, here we have an apparatus uh, of a disintegration. Now, as I said, in, in immediate release products that are highly permeable and highly soluble, in this particular case, disintegration can be the rate limiting step. If the tablet is compressed too hard, it doesn't disintegrate very rapidly and the drug is not released. But for most IR products and most other products, disintegration is not usually the rate limiting step. But in the case of this specific case where we have a highly variable, I mean, I'm sorry, highly permeable, uh, rapidly dissolving, highly soluble DCS1, uh, disintegration is an important step. Next slide. So dissolution becomes more of interest is that although the particles are in disintegration are just from big particles, little particles, it is the rate in which those, the active ingredient gets into solution. And we talk about solubility and dissolution almost interchangeable, but they're not exactly. Solubility is a static property. So we can look at sodium chloride dissolves in 2.786 mils. Uh, that's a property of sodium chloride. However, if the sodium chloride is in little powder or sodium chloride is in a cube, it, the rate in which it's going to dissolve in that water is going to be different, even though the actual solubility is the same. If you wait a while, the, the one gram of sodium chloride will dissolve as, as is stated. So dissolution is a dynamic quality and we are looking at it a, as a rate phenomena. And if it's the slowest step in absorption, then it becomes the rate limiting step. And if it's the rate limiting step, then the dissolution test becomes useful in looking at in vitro and vivo uh, correlations and things of that sort. Next slide. Now, Noyes and Whitney uh, looked at this on how the drugs, solids, particles dissolve. And although this is a basic equation, uh, there are now newer kinds of equations that have adopted this. And what I'm just really showing the basis uh, of this. So 
we're looking at diffusion from the, of the drug uh, from the tablet into the bulk solvent. And I think the next slide will be better a visual on this. Okay, so here's a beaker and we have the tablet or a particle, and it's not the tablet, but the particle containing the drug. The drug dissolves right around the particle and it's a saturated solution. Uh, that's the C sub S. And the bulk solvent around it is, is a C. So there is a concentration gradient from the uh, saturated part from there. And a visual would be a tea bag where if you just put a tea bag into hot water, there's initially a lot of color around the tea bag and around the rest of the glass of water is very clear. If you jiggle that bag up and down, which gives uh, some agitation, then it moves a little there, but there's a concentration gradient. The other important factor is surface area. So larger particles have less surface area compared to smaller particles. The H is the thickness uh, of that stagnant layer. By agitating, you disrupt that uh, thickness and therefore the dissolution is quicker. And the letter D is really a diffusion constant to balance the equation. Uh, and C is concentration, so it's a concentration versus time. Uh, next slide. So when we do this uh, actual step in dissolution, we usually look at the percent of label dissolving per hour or milligrams dissolved per hour. We consider it as a rate uh, that we have. Next slide. Okay, so things that influence dissolution are the properties of the drug, as I mentioned, uh, solubility, uh, particle size, things of that sort, the type of drug product. Now, if you have an immediate release product, it's meant to dissolve very quickly. Uh, if you have an uh, extended release drug product, it's designed to release the drug over a period of time. So that's gonna make a difference. Or you could have an orally dis disintegrating product, or you could have other things as well. The medium that you put it in, the composition, the volume, the pH, and the temperature will make differences. The agitation, as I said, shaking that tea bag up and down or shaking your tablet up and down, uh, though it'll do it as well, and the type of apparatus. So next slide. Uh, here we have a group of excipients, and excipients will make a difference. One of the big culprits is magnesium uh, stearate, which is used as uh, a glidant. It's, it's uh, hydrophobic and more uh, magnesium stearate or how thick you coat your tablets with it uh, will slow dissolution. And that's what this little slide shows. So e each of the excipients and all can affect the interaction with the active ingredient and the dissolution rate. The next slide. So why do we use dissolution uh, and release tests? It helps in the de development uh, of a formulation. For example, you have an immediate release product and you now want to make an extended release product. You can sort of calculate how much you want in that formulation. For example, if you're giving 50 milligrams three times a day and you want to make an extended release, well, the total daily dose 50 three times a day is 150 milligrams. So you want to put 150 milligrams in that formulation and to then deliver 150 milligrams over the course of, of the day, uh, whether it's eight hours or 12 hours, but you want to do that. So this solution helps you to see whether the formulation is doing what you're hoping to do. The other is in batch to batch reproducibility. I mentioned that in the drug product performance. Every time you manufacture a batch, you wanna be sure that it has the same performance test. The other we use is in stability. Um, the other, the third or fourth on this list, I guess, is in vitro and vivo correlation. And I'm gonna address this in a bit is that if you can correlate the rate of dissolution to the rate of absorption of the product, then any changes in your product would be uh, seen in the rate in which the drug is absorbed. That is very difficult to do in practice. And the last one, as I mentioned, that when you're changing or scaling up a formulation, 
uh, we're changing anything, we use this solution again as a product performance test. Uh, next slide. Okay, now there are issues in performing the dissolution test. It is, we use the word discriminating. The idea is that the dissolution test will show whether you have changed the formulation in such a way that it's gonna change the drug product performance and that the drug may, may be either delivered too rapidly or not rapidly enough into the body. So if you're changing the hardness, if you're changing the magnesium stearate or something, uh, you may want to be looking at the ability of, of that dissolution test to show that you have changed something in the manufacturing process that's important. But the problem sometimes is that it can be too discriminating, uh, that any slight changes makes the dissolution uh, rate uh, change when it really doesn't make any difference in the absorption of the drug. Minor changes in the solution rate may have no effect in vivo. So we have the concept, and, and a, an example here too would be uh, if you also have a uh, paddle and you're, you're rapidly agitating uh, in the dissolution vessel, or go back to my tea bag and shake it up and down a lot, then the, the rate is not discriminating and any changes will not be seen. So we have a manufacturer's risk and a consumer risk. And what I mean by that is if the manufacturer rejects the batch, it's going to be very expensive. They have to re-manufacture. If the manufacturer decides to well, this is just a small change in the solution, it shouldn't do anything, at least he hopes it doesn't do anything, then it becomes a consumer risk because there's a drug actually going to perform in the patient. Uh, and if not, then there's gonna be a problem there. So there's that risk of how do you interpret that dissolution test? Uh, next slide. All right, so the USP has a mechanism for development and validation uh, of that. And I'm going to go for because of time. But when you do the uh, any kind of testing, you should always validate your, your testing results. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, also in the USP, and I'll go through this quickly, has a number of apparatus for different products, such as tablets, capsules, extended release products, and such. And, and I would refer you to the United States Pharmacopeia that has a chapter that describes all these different apparatus and how they're used. So we go to the next slide. Okay, this is a typical uh, uh, apparatus for uh, tablets to paddle method. You see the paddle and there's usually six and most people do six at a time, although there's ones that do 12 or more. Uh, and notice that the various components of it, you have a stir, you have a temperature control, you have vertical uh, shafts and all kinds of things, the size of the container, the media, all of these are important. And those are described in the USP. So next slide. Okay, so you get what you see on the left. You have a tablet that is dissolving in a flask and there's a little paddle above it and that's slowed down, samples are taken out and we see the rate of dissolution. The question then is, does that relate to the in vivo situation? And that's where we're talking about in vitro and vivo correlation. Somehow or other, we wanna relate the dissolution that we see on the left to the in vivo absorption of the drug, which we're calling drug product performance. Next slide. So the goal is to find a relationship between some in vitro characteristics in, in dissolving and some characteristics in vivo. So we, we're trying to describe some sort of relationship. Uh, next slide. Question? Well, we could take a break here and then we'll come back to the end of the for a few minutes. Is that uh, agreeable? You, would you like to take a, a 10 minute quick break here? 
Uh, yes, sir. Surely we will take a break here. Okay, Sorry, we'll take... there is some connectivity problem due to which I am not able to communicate you on time. Thank you so much, sir, for cooperating. Sure, we are going on a break of ten minutes, probably, sir. Um, yeah, five would okay. be fine. Just uh, I'll get, I'm going to get a glass of water and and we'll start again okay. in about five Thank minutes. Thank you. So let, I have eleven twenty-five. 11.30, uh, that's my time. I don't know what it is, your time. Okay, so the time is 9.25 p.m. Okay. 9.30, we'll start. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so 9.30. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I will request all the participants to please uh, compile all of your questions about the presentation, and then I will ask from sir. Okay, sounds good. Hello, Hafsa. Did you did you say something? Uh, yes, sir. I requested for a five minutes break because uh, Sir Leon was talking continuously. So I thought that there is a need to take a break of five minutes. Sir, are you listening me clearly? Yes, we are listening you clearly. No, please, uh, the others, please do not unmute your Hello, Hapsa, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Sir, can you hear me? Sir, Hassan? Uh, Hafsa, uh, yes. Professor Dr. Asadullah Madni here. Uh, can you please uh, uh, say to all the participants to mute their mics? Please. Yes, sir. I already requested many times, but there is a problem because the different people join from different platforms, like some are from uh, Zoom app and some are from the browser. So the controls do not work properly everywhere. So I'm re continuously requesting to please do not unmute your mics. While we are on break, please co compose all of your questions and I will ask one by one because we have a very short time. And as you can see that uh, Sir Leon is already tired due to continuously talking and communicating with us. So please manage this thing. Plus I will share I will share the video in the form of recording on YouTube. Yes, sir, but. Oh, well, I'm back, but no, I'm not that tired. I just uh, needed uh, some water. Okay. Right. Uh, sir, are you okay? I'm fine. Should we can... She has. Uh, could okay. you kindly could Wait, are there some questions to this point that you would like me to answer before we move on uh yes sir 
uh, one question that I received that some drugs are registered in one country and not in the other countries due to specifications of uh, regulatory bodies. Then how we can say drugs are safe? The question is from Muhammad Yasir Ali, Sir Muhammad Yasir Ali. The, the question I, I, I need a little more clearly is how do you determine drugs are safe in the specifications? Yes, sir. He's asking that some are registered in one country, but not in other countries. So what are the specifications from the regulatory bodies? Well, specification it is an issue. Um, and I'm glad you brought it out because that, that's a very important question. Every drug is unique. So what happens, and this is one of the reasons that the United States Pharmacopeia has all these expert commi uh, committees, is they try to develop specifications as well as FDA does as well, to say what is the quality. And I mentioned, for example, impurities. Uh, you say that the active ingredient is pure and, and high quality or whatever, but what is the acceptable impurity? If it's 99.9%, .9%, is that important? Or is it 99.5% or 99%? How much are we willing to accept? And this is a, a dynamic between regulatory <coughs> and scientific on any product. We do a dissolution, we're talking about dissolution. Uh, before we say that the dissolution is not gonna be exact every time you run a batch. It's not going to have the exact. So we put on some sort of specification that more than so much dissolves or not less than so much dissolves in the first hour or the first two hours or, or et cetera. So for everything we have, we have specifications. Now, often there is a little bit of a dynamic or political action. The industry would like to have wide specifications. Why would they like to have wide? So they don't reject batches when they manufacture it. So they say, well, we can be 90 to 110% of, of the label active ingredient. And FDA says, well, no, I think it should be 95 to 105. Well, this one is warfarin. Warfarin is or thyroxine. That should be maybe 98 to 102. And then we'll say, well, we can't manufacture that, that tight because we're doing a tablet machine that goes 10,000 tablets a minute. And we're going to have some variability there. <clears throat> so this idea of specifications comes in almost every product and every step of the product. So I don't have an exact information on what specifications are. They are developed by committee, and you know how well committees work together, with different ideas, a little give and take, and what seems to be an acceptable. And as I haven't gotten to the generic and bioequivalents, but if you think about it, it's the statistics that determines whether it's equivalent or not. And in a sense, you can think of that as specifications because what are the acceptable statistics? We could say, well, it's too tight. We got 80 to 125%. This is a narrow therapeutic drug. Maybe it should be instead of 80 to 125, 90 to 110 or whatever. So it's a long-winded answer. But this is something important that for every product should have well thought out specific uh, specifications and should be done rationally through some scientific uh, research and process. I hope that helped. Thank you, sir. And another question is while performing dissolution studies, uh, sometimes we use tweens uh, in the way that we are forcing the dissolution. So uh, there, then there must be a failure of IVC, IV, uh, IVC correlation. So what would you say about this? Well, that's what I have coming up next is about in vitro and vivo correlation yes. and about failure of in vivo and vitro correlation. And in general, you fail more times than you have it uh, and it's product specific, but we'll come to that. Uh, is there another question? And I'll, I'll answer this as we talk about in vitro and vivo. Uh, no, sir. Now we can continue. All right, so if everybody's okay, uh, we, we can go on and look at in vitro and vivo correlation. As, as I mentioned, you're, you're looking at some sort of uh, parameter that 
is biological yes, and some physical chemical parameter that you get from the dissolution test and trying to say there's a relationship between the two processes. There's some relationship between dissolution and some relationship to the in vivo. Um, and, and next slide, please. Yes, sir. He's uh, actually asking about the dissolution parameters that you are, you are going to discuss. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. So if we go to the next slide. Okay, there are several categories of in vitro and vivo correlation. Again, I refer to the United States Pharmacopeia on that, as well as the FDA. And I'm really going to address level A because that's the really true uh, highest category of correlation. And we're looking at point to point relationship between in vitro dissolution and in vivo input rate uh, and compares percent drug absorbed, I'm sorry, percent drug released versus percent drug absorbed. So we go to the next slide. Uh, what we have is points following the, the, the solution, and we have points following drug absorption. So that's called a point-to-point -point correlation and is developed. And hopefully the in vitro dissolution curve then serves, and we use the word surrogate, for in vivo performance. Um, but we still use the dissolution test even whether we do get or we don't get a, a correlation. But ideally, a change in manufacturing or a change in uh, raw materials or any kind of change in, in the product is going to be reflected in the dissolution and will be reflected in the absorption. Uh, ne next slide. Okay, so there are a number of newer computerized methods, which uh, I don't have the wherewithal right now to describe, but most of it is based on an early approach uh, done by uh, Wagner and his colleague Nelson. It's called the Wagner-Nelson. It's a deconvolution method. Uh, there are other approaches, but this is probably the basis of most of them. And the way we look at this is the dose of the drug, that's D sub zero. All right. And we're looking at mass balance. So when you swallow that tablet, which would be the dose, some of the drug is going to be in the gastrointestinal tract, DGI, some of the drug is going to be in the body and some of the drug gets eliminated, okay? And we see a um, curve uh, that's on the right of what happens if we were measuring blood levels. The drug comes in the body and it goes out of the body and eliminated. So what we want to do is look at this absorption curve and try to see, can we measure the rate or fraction of the, the amount of drug absorbed at any one time? That's, that's our goal. So we have AB is the amount of drug in the body. Now, one is we can measure the concentration of the drug in the body, and we know the volume distribution. And if you think about it, concentration times volume gives you mass. So we're talking about mass here. So if you look at the units, A, A is a mass milligrams or micrograms. CP volume is that. And then we look at... Finish all yeah. Uh, then we look at drug removal, uh, that tail end of the curve. And the AUC, if we look at it, represent the whole AUC from AUC zero to infinity, represents all the drug that's absorbed within the time. It doesn't mean a percent of drug absorbed, but it if you give uh, those 100 milligrams, a certain portion is going to be absorbed. And that's reflected in the AUC. Uh -huh. So what we want to do is capture in the bottom. Yeah, it's a little hard to talk over that. Yes. <laughs> okay, so what we're trying to get to is a fraction of drug absorbed. That's the AB over AB affinity. What that really means that you can determine K is the elimination rate, AUC is a zero to T. So if you set time for 15 minutes, say the first drug, blood draw, you know the AUC from zero to 15 minutes, you know the elimination rate K, you know the concentration at 15 minutes, and you divide that 
by the total AUC and also the K. So it's the fraction absorbed at 15 minutes divided by the total amount of drug absorbed. I hope everybody got that. And that gives you a fraction. If you multiply by 100, you get percent. So this is a way of getting percent absorbed. So let, let's look at the next slide. I hope that's not too, confu too confusing. So what we have on A is our plasma level time curve. And what we want to do is do the process of deconvolution, which is that Wagner-Nelson method. And try to then make that curve that is goes up and goes down, a typical blood level time curve, into somewhat of a straight line, which is on the right, which is fraction of drug absorption. We then have our dissolution in vitro, which is percent drug absorbed, dissolved. So we have how much is dissolved at 15 minutes, how much is dissolved at uh, 10 hours, in this case, 20 hours, whatever. And we have how much drug was absorbed at certain time. So now we put D, which is percent dissolved versus uh, percent absorbed. And I sort of cheated a little bit in this picture because I made a real straight line. Uh, as you know, if you're an ex researcher, you don't always get such an exact straight line, but in general, you'll get something that's linear. Uh, and we then say, well, there's a relationship and you have to do a little statistics on this uh, correlation coefficient that this indeed is a relationship between percent absorbed and percent dissolved. So, so that's where we are on the validation. Next slide. Uh, now, the problem with immediate release products is they rapidly absorbed, and you don't get that much in terms of the upswing of the absorption curve. It's important to be able to get a number of time samples. But if it's absorbed within uh, 30 minutes to an hour, uh, you only have maybe a 15 minute and a 30 minute uh, point. It's hard to get uh, in vitro and vivo correlations with rapidly uh, dissolving products. So the next slide. Now, so IVIVC works when it works for extended release drug products for the best uh, correlations. Uh, but to do this, you can't rely on one formulation. You really need at least two. And, you, you, and, and that's one of the reasons generic companies do not necessarily do that because you got to do a slow release product or a slower released uh, extended release product and a more rapid release extended release product. And then look at the blood level time curves and go back to what I said is you're going to look at percent dissolved and percent absorbed. Now, also, depending upon the apparatus that you use, you get different dissolution curves. So you have to be sure that the type of dissolution test is going to be appropriate in terms of this correlation. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. okay, so the IVIVC is dependent upon the dissolution conditions and the drug formulation. So it's very specific to the drug formulation. Now the generic drug product may not be the same formulation as I mentioned in the earlier time as the uh, branded. So they're not gonna have the same IVIVC and most generic drug companies are not going to intentionally make a slow releasing and a fast releasing drug product. They just want a product that's going to match the in vivo um, uh, characteristics, you know, bioavailability, bioequivalence as the brand. So they're happy if they can do that and such. All right. So we go to the next slide. Okay, so I don't know how we need to go to the slideshow. I guess you might want to do that. Thank you. So it is difficult, is what I'm getting at, to, to always get an IVIVC. But it's nice if you have it, because you can then use it for uh, developing your product and changing formulation and such. And in some cases, the uh, if you have a product that is... Uh, the dissolution step is not the rate of the step. Absorption through the membranes of the gastrointestinal tract is the rate of the step. So even though the drug dissolves at different rates, it's going to sit there 
and eventually gets absorbed through the uh, gastrointestinal tract. The drug dissolution test, therefore, is not the rate limiting, and you, you will not get an IVIDC uh, test. All right, next slide. All right, so also you may not establish one because the dissolution method it, it doesn't reflect it. You're going through different pHs in the gastrointestinal tract. The stomach is low at pH 1 and 2. The duodenum is higher on 6, 5, and up. So some people have looked at bio-relevant dissolution methods, um, considering GI transit, pH, and such. Now, there is a program, Gastric, Gastric Plus, that is trying to put all these things together. And some people are using it. I have not used it, so I can't uh, address it in detail. But I have looked at it from other uh, papers, and it's an interesting approach. So various uh, physiological parameters such as first pass effects and other things can affect whether this is going to correlate or not. So the answer to that question, it's nice if you get it in vitro and vivo correlation, but you may not get it uh, in practice. And next slide. Okay, the last sort of, well, more nearly last, I want to talk about this. If you think about um, a closed system versus an open system, uh, the in vitro dissolution test is a closed system. The drug comes out and it stays in that bulk solvent. And in a sense, the concentration gradient can be changing. Uh, if the bulk solvent gets saturated, it's a problem. The USP says you have to have a large enough solvent that you don't have a nonlinear dissolution pro test. So the in vivo system, as a drug is absorbed, it's also being eliminated. So you never have this concentration problem uh, that you difference that may be different in the in vitro system. So I just wanted to contrast that. We don't always think about open versus closed systems. Uh, next uh, slide. Okay, but don't throw away the dissolution test. It's very important. It helps in generic drug development. It helps to design modified drug release it helps that if you're making lower strengths by BioWaver, you don't, if you're developing say a 100 milligram generic product and you have a 50 milligram and a 25 milligram product, it's the same for, formulation as 100. It's just that it's um, say a 50 is one half of the size tablet, 25, it's the same formulation. Do we really need to do more in vivo studies? Instead, we can do dissolution studies. So if the dissolution studies match up, then it's very useful. It's not a correlation, but it shows that you may work. And as I mentioned, any changes, a new formulation, old formulation, dissolution is done. So uh, dissolution testing is very helpful. Next slide. Okay, next slide. So what we wanna do is compare dissolution. Uh, and the, the thing is, is whether the slides are different or, or the same. And this goes in a sense of your uh, specifications. You set up two curves and you want to see whether they're similar. And we'll go to the next slide. Okay, we have a term called similarity factor. And basically this was developed to look at two curves point by point. And it's called F2, which is the reciprocal of the F1. This is of the equation in the previous. I didn't want to dwell on the previous. But what you're doing is you compare a reference formulation to a test formulation. You look at um, the dissolution test. And N being the number of time points, you're comparing each time point of one reference time point to the test reference. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. We have, this could be two different batches of the same product. It could be a generic versus brand. It could be a lower um, strength product, say 100 milligram versus 50 milligram. But the question is, are these two curves the same or are they not the same? I mean, obviously there are a little difference in there. So we do the 
F2 in it's in a sense like a statistical uh, approach saying there's no real difference and we can accept that they're both the same. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I just want to summarize that biopharmaceutics, when we started this talk, uh, are, is uh, considering the physical chemical properties of the drug, drug product, and, and drug product performance. Uh, we look at systemic drug absorption from a drug product as a series of steps, uh, and we're interested in the rate limiting step when we're talking about dissolution, and that's the slowest step in the kinetic process. So uh, I hope this addressed some of the biopharmaceutics aspects. And I think the next few lectures, and I don't know we'll have enough time for it, but we'll, let's give it a try. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Okay, I won't dwell on this. As I said, there are certain considerations in biopharmaceutics when we're going to design a drug and a, and a drug product. So these are sort of a, a list of things to, to consider. Uh -huh. Excuse me, sir, as you know that we have a little time left. So if you will say, you just discuss these slides and I will share with uh, the audience yes, and the people who are- to uh, stop at this point. The next, if you just want to turn the slide to the next one and you're going to have this available. So the next set of slides will be in uh, vivo performance studies, but we can now discuss any questions you have, certainly. Okay, I'll please ask to... questions in the chat as we have a lit very little time left. So I cannot allow everyone to go live. Professor, Dr. Harris here. I want to ask some questions. Yes, sir, please ask. Uh, first of all, I'm extremely thankful, Dr. Sharjil, for being with us uh, uh, today. Um, I also... Um, teach biopharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics. There are many questions. Uh, there are many uh, questions because uh, I use your book as a reference. Uh, first of all, the slide which you have actually uh, given that is about the IVIVC, in which you have mentioned about the deconvolution method, uh, especially for the, the Wagner-Nelson method. Actually, Wagner-Nelson method is, uh, uh, if you see, for oral one compartment model drug. And uh, what about the two compartment model drugs? Uh, how can we implement deconvolution there? So I suggest that why not going for convolution method means uh, predicting the AUC and Cmax from the in, vit in vitro dissolution data, rather back calculating it from the in vivo data. Uh, there are uh, uh, some references to and obviously uh, many use this convolution method for this IVIVC studies. And then uh, the dissolution-based bioweva, which you have actually in the next slide, there is also a difference between FDA and WHO for this dissolution-based bioweva. WHO is a little bit more relaxing for the dissolution-based bioweva, means it actually allows not only for class one, but some of the class two and even for class three drugs while FDA is still focusing and is still allowing only for the class one drug. So what is your opinion about that? That why there is a difference between the two uh, regulating WHO and the FDA? And then the, about this IV, IVC approach. Thank you. And I also use GastroPlus. I, I want to say that I'm also using GastroPlus. I have a license to use GastroPlus, it's an excellent software for PBPK studies. That is physiological based pharmacokinetic models. Yes. It's an excellent. Yes, sir. Uh, over to you, sir, Leon. Well, this is one of the reasons that we've moved our textbook to multi authors. Um, what I wanted to do is give the basis of the con uh, deconvolution, but over the period of years, the, each of these areas expanded. Uh, to a point that I'm not really involved in some of the areas that you've mentioned. I'm aware, yes, that, that you have uh, two compartment model drugs and you have other uh, issues. What I wanted to just state is that the, the issue basically is converting an in vitro process and comparing it to an in vivo absorption and, and rate. So there are many approaches to this. Gasher Plus is just one of the many uh, people who are getting into um, 
in vitro and vivo correlation and predicting drug absorption and predicting solubility, predicting bioavailability. But in, honestly, um, we have moved into getting experts in the field to give us chapters to address these. And I, I can't address the specifics of each of these programs. I can address more. Phoenix of it. Win is also. Yeah, uh, you're you correct. Yes, Winline Lin. So we have, as I said, um, I'm very, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> very thankful to my colleagues who give me help on this when I need. So I go to experts. So I, I may have to call upon you to uh, give me a hand on this since you know Gasher Plus and I don't. Uh, thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll definitely. <coughs> Uh, I also some we can't know every. What can I say? We can't know everything. So I'm trying to give a bit um, of basics. Uh, some yes, of these please. I'm requesting that we have five minutes left behind, and we have to present a certificate of acknowledgement uh, to Sir Leon Charger. And I will request Sir Hassan to please present this certificate on the behalf of Department of Pharmacology, University Government College, University Faisalabad. Uh, Sir Hassan, uh, please join. Uh, sorry, uh, Sir Hassan. Okay, Sir, uh, may I present this certificate on the behalf of Sir Hassan? Oh, yes, Sir Hassan is with us. Sir, please, may I display the certificate, Sir Hassan? Okay, I'm going to display the certificate. So we have some connectivity. Uh, we, we will we'll be sending later, uh, Hafsa. We, we can we can uh, convey many thanks from our uh, for audience, yes, right? Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you so much, Sir Leon Charger. You're quite welcome. Are you listening? Yes, sir. Uh, 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 Hafsa. So just just give me a few few seconds to, to yes, say thanks sir. to sir. Yes, sir, please. So. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir, there is some connectivity problem. Uh, Hafsa, uh, he is Professor Dr. Asad Mamadni. Uh, sorry, and, uh, we have no time left behind and I need to conclude this session. Thank you so much okay, for all the okay. questions. There's and really one thing, one thing that uh, must, yes, be, must be conveyed to Professor uh, Leon Charger. Yes, sir. That uh, there yes, must sir. be some another uh, uh, lecture on in vivo performance also. And... Uh, uh, we will have uh, interactive session of question answer session of at least uh, half. Okay, uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir Leon Charger, I'm very, very grateful to you that you have given us some time. I cannot express my feelings. The response I have gotten from the different departments and different universities all over the Pakistan, in fact, and uh, I'm I'm really, really grateful. Grateful. I cannot express my words. And I'm uh, the department from uh, the I'm presenting the pharmacology department. All of my teachers, they are actually very happy that we, you joined us live. And thank you so much. And sorry for all the disturbances that happened due to connectivity problems because the internet quality in different areas of Pakistan is different. You can understand. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for joining us. I will present you the certificate and the certificate, certificate then will go with you. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. My pleasure. Okay, sir. Last but not the least, sir, you can just imagine that uh, at this time, uh, more than 70 people from here, from Pakistan, showed the love and the passion that they wanted to learn from your book. And we will definitely be sharing your book uh, in, in each and every institution of, uh, of uh, pharmacy here in Pakistan so that they could also learn 
we'll also with your due permission we'll also uh, upload this this very fascinated session on air so that uh, uh, if you would allow so that the, the the newcomers the students my colleagues and the senior professor could learn much more from your experiences it has been a very nicely designed talk believe me i loved it it has started the whole journey which you you have gone through and then the specifically the biopharmaceutics and the and the relation of the in vitro and the in vivo studies and their correlation that's superb we really appreciate we really appreciate thank you very much sir thank you very you're quite welcome, and it's my pleasure, and hopefully we'll uh, continue this discussion. So, okay, thank you so much, sir. Okay. Thank you once again. Have a very good morning there. Okay. We are going to have a good thank you so much, sir. All right, bye now. <laughs>